Thanks for coming. My name's Nick, and um, I know uh, several of you have come to this many times, uh, potentially have a, some idea of what these are like. Maybe they're all different. I don't know. I, I'm here because uh, six months ago I came to see uh, Laura Gibson do one of these talks. Uh, she was upstairs with a, a contemporary American piece of work. And I thought it was a really interesting thing to do, and I met uh, the fine people here and talked to them about doing this. And, and we talked about dates, and we said, you should come in. So I came in a few months ago um, with Betsy walking through the gallery, and we'd, I just looked around, and we were just talking about everything, and tried to find um, a piece that just really drew me in and, and just sort of had this magnetism to it, and not to intellectualize it too much or, or have any predisposed ideas. And I don't have any art training. I don't have any visual art training. And um, uh, so I had a pretty open mind. And we were just walking through, and we walked past this piece, and I instantly was drawn to it. Uh, I instantly saw a dancer uh, getting a massage. And I instantly thought of... Um, <laughs> Anybody have a cell phone? Turn that off for now. Um, uh, I do a lot of work with dance and uh, composing music for dance. And so I'm used to this scene, I've seen it a lot, where on the stage the, the dance is presented as this uh, effortless, porcelain, uh, beautiful thing. And as soon as the dancer gets off stage, they're heaving, they're out of breath, they're, they're throwing up, and it's um, this constant battle to uh, put this beauty on stage. And, and there's so much work that goes into it to keeping the the dancers' bodies maintain. It's, a, it's similar to professional athletes. Um, in like the second they step off the field or the court, there's a team of people pounding on them, trying to get their bodies into shape. Um, and so I instantly responded to this. And uh, we walked along and, and went through, uh, you know, we're in the Impressionist wing. Um, and so I, I generally felt like uh, a comradeship with Impressionists, or I felt like it was something that I, I generally uh, was drawn to, I think most people are. Uh, we, we kept walking uh, more modern pieces, and I saw some other pieces that I thought of, but I kept thinking back to this one. And I was like, this is good, but uh, I just keep thinking of this sculpture. And it's, it's funny for several reasons. Um, I've never particularly been that drawn to sculpture at all. Um, I, I thought I was going to find a painting. And um, this piece was created by Edgar Degas, and he was primarily a painter. And not, uh, not known for his sculptures. And in fact, uh, he only ever presented one sculpture in his life, and it was not this one. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, I, I came back later and I met with uh, Philippa Pitts, and we stood around this for an hour, and I asked her a bunch of questions, and we, and we talked. And um, so a lot of those conversations and my own research informed my understanding of, of this piece, which I knew nothing about when I first saw it other than I saw a dancer in that struggle to maintain her body. Um, so because it's related to dance, um, uh, Degas was certainly somebody who painted a lot of dancers. Um, probably um, m maybe half of his works involved dance at some point, and he often painted people behind stage uh, and uh, different scenes of ball ballerinas. Um, so I wanted to start off by, I wrote this piece um, that is, uh, I guess it'll explain itself, but it's, um, it's called How to Enjoy Dance. If we have Wi Fi, is that useful? Please, yeah. <laughs> I brought this little guy in because they were concerned about, uh, when I said I was bringing an electric guitar, that it was going to be really loud. So I thought I'd uh, allay everyone's concerns by bringing this little battery-powered guy, but um, he might be a little extra sensitive to wireless transmission. I often perform music that accompanies dance, and often I have friends 
come to the performances, friends who have never in their lives thought to go out and see dance. They come to support me and they sometimes enjoy the experience, I think. But often they have this bewildered look in their eyes. They preference, preface their comments to me with, well, I don't know much about dance or I'm not sure I really got it. People are always saying that about dance and it's frustrating to hear. I know that it's because most people have grown up without going to any dance other than the Nutcracker and have not developed the tools to understand it. You forget how you've learned to understand film, for example, by seeing so many in your life and how each one has subtly given you a guidebook to how movies are structured and that you use these tools when you watch every film. You're conditioned to understand the narrative, to have patience through the darkness of the second act, to expect resolution by the end of it. But with dance, most people feel like they have been thrown into the pool without knowing how to doggy paddle. It's terrifying. It makes people panic. What do I do? Everyone's moving around and I don't know the story. I don't know what these shapes mean. It's understandable. We're used to having control over our experience. We don't like being lost in the wilderness. I feel fortunate that I fell into dance. It grabbed me when I wasn't looking for it. And I came to it with an open heart. And sometimes, I think it's stupid or relevant or chaotic, but many times I jump out of my seat while watching a dance piece, wishing that all my friends were there, knowing that they would be jumping out of their seats too. At those moments, I want to thrust a fist in the air and say, I get it. Maybe I should write a list of how to enjoy dance. I would never do this for people in New York City, but maybe in Fremont, Michigan, where we do our workshops, I could write out a guide to enjoying dance and insert it in the evening's program. It would go like this. How to enjoy dance. You can relax in the knowledge that this dance is here for you to enjoy. It is not here to alienate you or make you feel bad for not understanding it. It wants to be understood. That you might find it pretentious or obtuse is natural, but don't let that first impression stop you from pushing further towards understanding. Find one beautiful thing and focus on that and enjoy it. This can't be hard. There's so much happening to enjoy. Pick one thing to dig on and just dig on it for as long as you like. Here are some possible things to enjoy. The violin arpeggios. The fall of the fabric of the dancer's skirt when she juts her hip out. The sound of feet hitting the floor during the pauses in the music. The way a dancer walks across the stage in an unchoreographed moment and how dancers don't walk like anyone else you know. The way a dancer catches its breath after an active moment. The coordinated effort of the musicians playing in concert. Just enjoy for a while the fact that adult humans from different backgrounds can arrange to get together at the same time and find the common language of music and play together on a stage. Think about how it just works, even in a discordant Stravinsky piece. Find the cutest dancer, the one you'd approach in a bar, the one you'd think about after she left, wishing you had said something funnier, wishing you had gotten her name, follow her as she moves about the stage. Get jealous when a man gets to lift her up. Stare at the eyes of the most confident dancer and picture her life that led up to this moment. The pre-dawn drives with mom to dance class. The discolored feet, the shaving of bunions. Think of how much experience goes into every movement and how easy their movements look. How you feel like you could get up there and do an arabesque. But really at your best, maybe you could get to 60% of the beauty of that shape and how that last 40% took the professional dancer 20 years and $80,000 to master. And isn't it nice that somebody went to all that trouble to refine such a craft? Imagine yourself hovering above the stage and the dancer's movements are tracing a sort of architecture. After all, architecture is a codified shape, easing and suggesting human movement. What kind of structure would be built around such movements as those of the dancers on this stage? What designs are created by the paths they trace? Think about how these repeated movements build up their own architecture larger than the body. You can see how the structure of a lobby in the building creates a certain flow of movement for people. Dance is an impermanent structure. We are all impermanent structures, so we should be able to appreciate this. Focus on the atmosphere the light makes, the way it carves out the big empty stage into a manageable space, into a forest, into a palace, into a prison, and how we all just believe that we are in that place. How does the dance correlate to music? It's not as simple as in a Texas two-step or a swing dance. Those are partner dances meant to be common language that can be shared by two strangers coming together. This is choreographed dance, which tries to throw out all the connotations to folkloric language and obvious reactions 
to musical styles. Choreographed dance avoids any mimery, anything that is literally interpreting the music. Choreography respects its collaborator and it tries to enhance the qualities of the music by bouncing off of it at odd angles. Failing all that, focus on the dancers' bodies. Maybe we should have started there. Enjoy them the way you would look at Greek sculpture, at an idealization of the human form somehow made real in the flesh. Envy their beauty and realize that beauty isn't as enjoyable to the beautiful person as it is to the beholder of the beauty, as hard as that is to accept. Speaking of, uh, uh, there, uh, sorry, <laughs> there is no physical tingle that comes from being beautiful. There is no particular bounce to your step, though it seems so. But don't worry about that. After all, you are the beholder, you are the audience. It is your job to appreciate beauty. And here we are. There is no scanner tracking your, where your eyes move, if they go to the right and proper place, or if they linger too much on the naughty parts. Appreciate what you can while you can. The bee doesn't have shame at moving towards color and scent. He plunges his face in the flower and wriggles around. Be a bee, plunge. Speaking of flowers, think of dance as a flower. You wouldn't stand in front of a flower and say, but I don't know what it means. I'm not sure I get it. You would just enjoy the flower if you found it beautiful. That would be enough. And if you had patience and grace, you would enjoy that beauty and try to extend that enjoyment outwards to the rest of the world. The way stories in a book help you see the beauty in strangers on the street. Dance is a flower, that's all you need to think of at first. Dance is a flower. When Degas was asked why he loved dance so much, why he always painted and sculpted ballet dancers, he replied, because it is all that has left us of the combined movements of the Greeks. There you go. All the other arts have captured moments in time, frozen documents of expression in marble or paint, of what the ancients dreamed and hoped, but only dance through a one-on-one -on -one connection of teacher to student has carried on the language of movement for hundreds of years using the endlessly pliable wax of the body. So, this piece. Um, this says that it was uh, sculpted, uh, this is called La Masseuse, by the way, the, the Masseuse. Uh, this has a very vague uh, years on it that says 1882 to 1885. Um, the reason why they don't know exactly when it was created is because he never showed it and he never meant to show it. Um, and that's because he uh, sculpted uh, a very famous sculpture uh, a few years before this one, uh, showed it in an exhibition, and um, it got some bad reviews. Uh, I'll show you the sculpture here. You've probably seen it before. It's of a dancer. It's very clearly a dancer. It's called the dancer, uh, uh, the 14-year-old dancer. And um, it, it was uh, put up at an exhibition, an Impressionist exhibition, and it, it was put in a, in a glass case. You can pass this around. Um, and it was made out of wax, and it was, um, he utilized an actual uh, ballet skirt and ribbons and a, and a bodice, like the real materials that they would have put on a dancer. And he put, actually, a wig of human hair on this sculpture of this 14-year-old girl. And because it was made in wax, uh, the, the coloration of it was um, possibly uh, disquieting. <laughs> um, it's kind of shocking to read some of the reviews, but uh, some of the quotes of, of critics at the exhibition said um, that this was a flower of precocious depravity with a face marked by the hateful promise of every vice and bearing the signs of a profoundly heinous character. Another one said, the pug nose, vicious face of this scarcely pubescent girl, a blossoming street urchin remains unforgettable. Um, it probably doesn't help that he put the, the sculpture inside a glass case, um, and it was made of this um, strange, it was built around armatures, like uh, pieces of wire and corks, and then uh, put this uh, wax over it that doesn't really, isn't very stable. And so even as he was making it, it was kind of falling apart. And then later on, uh, when he just had it in his studio, it just fell apart. And then they kind of put it together and, and cast bronze statues over it. Anyway, he, he put this uh, piece up, and it was rejected. And that was the last time he exhibited any sculpture. Um, so 
it's interesting because uh, to me, uh, thinking about the idea of failure, there, there's um, uh, when, when you're uh, an artist, when you're performing, when you're trying to present things to the public, um, you're, you know, the, re the reception, um, especially the first time you do something, rings really loudly. And so he never wrote about this, he never spoke about whether he was like personally hurt by this, but when I hear that somebody sculpted something, it didn't go well, and then he continued to sculpt and made dozens of sculptures in his life, but never showed any of them, um, to me, I picture him being a little uh, hurt. <laughs> um, uh, I was, so we can put our own impressions on how he felt about that. I kind of picture him in his studio sculpting and just saying, well, fine then, I'll just keep these to myself, you know? But, so this piece came after that, and um, uh, I, I didn't realize it at first, but so this was never meant to be, this was never meant to be seen by people. Um, it was never, in his lifetime, seen by anybody. Um, he had all these sculptures in his studio that he never showed anyone. They're made out of wax, and after he died, they made plaster casts, and they uh, did uh, bronze casts of this. So this is bronze cast of a wax sculpture. And this also had um, armatures in here, like wires and corks. Um, so he built this up. This um, sort of chase lounge here is um, actually built from like wood blocks. And um, the, the, uh, when I was sitting here talking to um, Philippa, uh, we talked for an hour. And then at the very end of it, I asked her, do you, do you like this? <laughs> Um, and she was, she was like, I hadn't thought of that. Um, I'm sure when this is your job, you don't necessarily think of that all the time, of whether you like something or not. Um, and she made a really interesting comment. She said she was first turned off by the hostility of it. She felt like the, the masseuse was violent, like it was hurting this woman. And um, she was turned off by that. Um, and uh, I guess... <laughs> I understand that, um, but I, uh, I, I think that's also what, what drew me to it. Um, and so, so this is coming from, uh, this is coming the Impressionist age. Like, if you walk through the exhibit upstairs, the Gods and Heroes, um, up until uh, the, the mid-1800s, um, uh, the art world was focused on realism, on portraits, historical paintings, still lifes. It was all trying to represent the world as accurately as possible. And so when you see those paintings, you don't see any of the um, artist's personality in it. They tried to remove any uh, impression that there was a, a person there painting. There was never any excess paint left on the canvas. There was never any even slightly different angle that would show the artist's own viewpoint. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about uh, works of art in the time, what was happening at that time. So, this is 1870s. Um, uh, photography is a new thing. The whole industrial revolution is happening. And in Paris, particularly, um, they were moving from the sort of agrarian life of, of lar uh, villages growing up to be large villages. And there was a movement by uh, Napoleon III to turn it into what we think of as a modern city of, of sort of plowing through some neighborhoods and building these big boulevards, the Champs-Elysees, so that you could more easily have it be a, a livable modern city and not just this ever-expanding village where everything just kind of twists and turns. Um, and this was not necessarily uh, what everybody wanted. I mean, like anything that changes, people were bemoaning the fact that now, um, you know, it's not a village anymore. It's not, uh, they thought that uh, there was this, um, uh, separation between them and their neighbors and that everybody was becoming isolated. And so when you look at all these works, these are all the Impressionist works here. Um, usually when you look at them, you think they're very idyllic pastoral scenes, but often there is a, a little twist to them that is, is a comment on the times. And this painting right here, this Renoir, is actually, it looks like just a scenic little dock scene, but this place is actually inside of a city, it's, it's like a modern park or a modern uh, recreational spot inside of a city and at the very edge of it you can see signs of uh, industry, of, of buildings at the edge. And so it's not obvious uh, when you look at it, but this is actually a comment on 
um, the changing, uh, the, the loss of the agrarian pastoral lifestyle and saying how now we are embracing it, now we are looking to get it back, but it's, it's kind of ruined because it, there's all this encroaching industry. Um, and obviously the, the hallmark of Impressionism is this, this color fleck, this move away from realism, which I don't think is any coincidence that it's um, coming right as photography is becoming more accessible because now you have a way to document something with a machine uh, as real as, as you can, um, more real than you could ever get with a paintbrush. And so it sort of takes away the job of the painter as far as like the strict documentarian uh, making portraits, documenting historical scenes. If you can capture that in a photograph, um, it's not as necessary. So coming all out of all of that is this movement of, of the Impressionist, of which Degas was associated with and, and exhibited with, but didn't necessarily consider himself uh, one of in style. And if you look at, I think this is one of his best paintings, uh, the dance class. Again, he's painting. He's fascinated with dance and behind the scenes of dance. And so this is a, a, a class of dancers. And you can tell he's amazing at uh, figures, at faces. There, there's probably 15 different figures in this painting. And each one of them, just by the way that they hold their body, you can learn a little bit about their personality. There's a, there's a man in the front who's teaching the class, an old man, um, who's probably well respected and well hated, I would imagine, um, because he's torching these young girls. But um, there's, there's maybe only one or two of these girls that are actually looking at this teacher. Every one of them is looking either bored or, or looking over at their friend. Or, um, and you learn so much about their personality through um, the way that he composes that. And so, um, in a way, the ways that this is impressionist is not by the, the standard technique of this color fleck, this sort of smudging of the lines, but it's more of the, the scenes that he chooses to take and the, and the perspective that he takes. Normally, you would never see this behind the scenes um, perspective on something. And he always um, uh, chose odd angles and, and odd uh, ways of centering the composition so that some people get cut out of the frame. Uh, the main person is not always at the center. It's not always dead on. <laughs> um, and a, a, another interesting influence on that was uh, something else that happened in the mid-1800s was uh, the country of Japan, which had been closed for uh, 200 years to any trade, any uh, outside commerce, um, if, you, if you were born in Japan and you left and you tried to come back, they would execute you. Um, you couldn't just visit Japan. You couldn't just sail up there. And um, in the 1850s or 1860s, they finally started to open up to trade. And people started to see what was in this, what was being produced in this country. If you can imagine all the art and style of, of Japan, if it had just been hidden and a secret for two centuries, and suddenly it was let out. Um, and, and that the influence on the Impressionists was, these, um, was the, the, the iconic Japanese style of, of printmaking, and, and which always had this almost comic book quality to the way that they uh, composed things and had odd angles and, and um, bright colors and sort of this uh, not going for realism, like almost caricature type quality. And it was a big influence on the Impressionists, which I think is really interesting. Um, so, all out of all of that um, uh, comes this piece, um, which is now Impressionism, but as a sculpture. And so you can tell, if you look at um, that sculpture down there, for example, actually that came later than this, but um, it's, it's, it's more of a, in the classical mode of, here's a woman uh, standing in a classical way, and, and it's smooth and appealing, but you don't see any of the, the touch of the artist in it, whereas this, um, I think it's fascinating to get really close to this and look at it. Um, it's depicting this violent scene of this massage, which is like hands in flesh, pushing, working. And you can see that same violent motion in the way that he sculpted this. You can see sometimes like his thumb or on this, on this side of the, the chair, you can see the, the way that he had to push this clay down um, to get this work. And I think it's just a fascinating, um, symbiosis between 
the, the scene that it's depicting and the style that you had to use to create it um, are both a very similar like mushing and melding and kind of this violent action. Um, uh, so um, to talk a little bit more about failure, I, uh, I'm a musician and I've been touring around the country for a while and I wrote this book recently. It's called Get It While You Can and it came out of a series of, of failures of um, not achieving what I wanted to achieve. Um, with music, it's very clear if you play to a room full of people and, or you play to a half room full of people, um, <laughs> your, your success uh, is, is right in front of you. Um, and, um, you know, in, in a similar way to the way that you exhibit paintings and you see the reaction right away. And, Maybe it's something that you've been working on for a year. Um, maybe it's too late to change it. Maybe you don't want to change it, but your, um, your feedback is coming right there. No pun intended. Um, so I'm just going to read a, a couple pages from this book um, that starts off talking about this failure. Thanks. I'm staring out the window at an orange kite hanging in the air. Its long tail is fluttering in the wind, but for a solid minute now, the diamond of the kite body has stayed motionless in the sky, almost as if it were pinned there. From my angle, I can't see the person holding the kite, and I'm much too far away to see the string. Just now, the unseen person has decided to let out a, a little more line. At first, the kite shudders like a sick dog trying to back out of one of those horrible neck cones. And then it accepts its new directive and rises out of view. To sum up, I'm looking out the window at a person flying a kite, but I can't see the person or the kite or the string. I see nothing. For a long time now, I thought music was the thing that would ground me. I still believe that in some ways, but what I have been caught up in lately is this. I feel that I'm good at writing a song and being able to play guitar at all the various skills that go into making a record, and yet for many years I've had the, ro the strong feeling that I've failed at music. Worse yet, I feel that since I've devoted my life to music, I've failed at life. I came to the Oregon coast because I want to learn how to sail. A young man named Daniel is my teacher. He's working at an Irish pub in town while helping his friend prepare his 29-foot fiberglass full-keel sailboat for a long sea voyage. In the spring, the two of them are going to try to sail to Hawaii. This morning, he left me with a very old copy of Rilke's letter to a young poet while he went to work. The covers are torn off and some pages are missing. I lingered on this passage. But in every sickness, there are many days when the doctor can do nothing but wait. And that is what you, insofar as you are your own doctor, must now do more than anything else. And this. Perhaps all the dragons in our lives are princesses who are only waiting to see us act just once with beauty and courage. Perhaps everything that frightens us is, in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. Learning to sail is an exercise in patience and humility. Our fate is dictated by the winds and the water, and yet we're able to take some fundamental control over that fate and make micro-adjustments that get us where we want to go. We take our boat out on the calmest day of the year. It is one of those overcast days on the northern coast where sky, sky and sea are the same color gray. And once you get out on the open water, you can't see the land anymore. You feel like you're in a Homeric poem where someone has cast a spell to put you in an in-between world. I feel okay for five minutes and then I start to get seasick. My sickness doesn't land after, or go away after throwing up or even when we get back to land. I've only been able to help Daniel out with a few lines, tie a few knots. Mostly I've been ballast. For this day, his training hasn't paid off. I can't even handle the calmest day of the year on the Pacific. 
I was upended by something I couldn't see. The rest of the world keeps insisting that invisible things don't matter, but like the kite outside the window, just because my frame of reference doesn't show me anything doesn't mean that nothing is there. Um, uh, so, um, I, I think uh, Degas is a, is a fascinating figure because um, he had all these, uh, you know, different skills, like to, to be able to do sculpture and to do stuff that now is seen as um, some of the first best examples of, of modern sculpture. Uh, this is another one of my favorite paintings of his. It's another dance scene. It's something on the stage, but it's also the whole upper corner of it is kind of just this blob of unfinished work, and it's, it's a really odd composition. The, the dancer is off-center, and it comes at you from a strange angle. Um, I was... Uh, uh, <laughs> so I, I worked on this, uh, researched this for a while, thinking that this was a dancer, and then I bought this book a few days ago, and I read this is from the Mets exhibition from 20 years ago. And in their description of this piece, uh, they refer to this figure here as, as a bather and not a dancer. Um, and I suppose you could be both, uh, although uh, in, in artistic terms, if you're talking about a figure, you're probably identifying it as a, a symbol of something more than an actual person. And so I kind of uh, panicked when I read that, and I thought, oh no, I'm, ta I'm talking about all this dance, and this is actually just a bather. And if you look at her body, um, it's sort of hard to see because she melds with this chair, but um, she might not have the body of a dancer, I mean, uh, at least in, in, in modern ballet terms. Um, she doesn't look light on her feet, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, and, and this chair, uh, this chair is probably not something you're going to find just backstage at, a, at, a, at an opera house. Um, it might be something more where a wealthier person would check in to, uh, to a bathhouse and, and receive this uh, massage work. Um, I think ultimately it doesn't necessarily matter um, whether it's a dancer. I mean, I mean clearly he was, uh, Degas was fascinated with dancers and he was fascinated with showing the, uh, the, the work that it took to uh, create art. Um, I mean, all the Impressionists were in, in their very function of showing all the brush marks, all the, the thumbprints and everything, um, they were displaying to you what it took to make this art and the pain that it took. And so um, whether or not it's a dancer, perhaps it doesn't matter. Um, and then uh, I was thinking about this piece again two days ago, and I, I went to get this, coincidentally, went to get this massage, um, which <laughs> I, I won't say much about because it's like telling somebody about your dream. It's not that interesting. but. Um, it, w it was a particularly deep tissue massage, and it's actually called, um, what is it called? Somato-emotional release. And so um, the idea that you have a pain that you experience in your life, and you put it in a little pocket, often in this area, and you keep it there, and then you protect it. And whether that guilt or shame or anger just sort of gets stored up there. And then when you breathe, you kind of don't breathe through that, because you say, oh, that's that time when I was 12 and that thing happened, or whatever it is, you know? And so there's various ways of approaching that. You can do talk therapy and work it out and say, what is this here? Is it that time when I was 12? Um, you can do energy work. You can do all sorts of things. This type of massage was all about, I'm uh, this man, this very strong man, put his hands deep in my abdomen and held them and said, uh, did you feel safe as a child? And, and <laughs> Questions like that, and, and it was all about um, getting at this pain and relieving it and leaving space for the diaphragm to be able to drop down and breathe deeper. And it was an incredible experience. It was 90 minutes, and um, I cried at the end of it, and I, I felt sore. I still feel sore. Um, and, I, and afterwards, I it just sort of stumbled around in a daze, like I had been um, just sort of hit the reset button on my body. and 
ever since then, I've just been able to breathe deeper and, and have the breath get down all the way to past my belly button and just fill my lungs. And then the air that comes out of my mouth just feels like this different wind. And um, while I was on that table uh, and he was working at me, it's funny, the things that come up. And the biggest thing that I thought was just uh, gratitude and, and, uh, and apology. Like I felt grateful for all the people that I've known in my life, all the people that helped me. And I felt sorry for the people where it didn't work out or can't talk to them anymore. And I just laid on that table and I just, I just felt so grateful for everything. And it made me think back to when I was standing here with Philippa and talking about this. And she said her first impression was that she didn't like it because it felt hostile. And um, now having that experience, um, you could call it hostile or violent the way that the movements are actually really violent, like pushing into you. But there is a certain violence that is productive and is actually for the benefit of the person. And so when I look at this, I see that violence and it just seems like something that almost spewed out of a volcano or something, the way that it's so um, uh, burbly and, and clumpy. But um, I think ultimately it's this violence for the good of somebody, you know? It, it, this person isn't a captive, it's not torture, it's actually something that's benefiting her. Um, so that's what came to me when I was having this massage. Um, so I wanted to, um, like I said, I, I, uh, I work with a company in New York and, and I compose music for contemporary dance and I wanted to play a piece that we do for dance and it's called Paper. And whenever I play this for people when there's no dance, I like to say that if you picture dance in your head, the, the dance you see in your head is probably more perfect, possibly better than any dance that you could actually realize <laughs> on the stage, um, just because it's in your head and you don't have to deal with all these aches and pains of uh, all the mistakes. Um, so this is a piece that we did with dancers from the New York City Ballet. We performed it at uh, the Brishnikov Center in Manhattan a couple of years ago. Um, normally it's on piano with a string quartet, but this is my friend Lauren and we're going to play it here. It's called Paper. <laughs>
that's it. Um, I don't have a watch, but I... <laughs> okay, great. Um, I, again, I'm not an expert, but I'm happy to take any questions with the group uh, um, if we want to talk about anything. Also, we're going to go to the cafe and, and have some wine, and, and we can talk there. So. Anybody have any questions or, or thoughts or discussion points? <laughs> so you said you weren't um, educated in art, visual no. art. So what was um, your thought process as, as you went through this? Because you're used to interpreting and knowing what's going on in your head, but not someone else's work. Right. So what was that like? Thought process in choosing it or in? in, in just the, once you chose the piece, right. how you researched it, thought, everything. Just, just trying to understand, you know, like, um, I, like I said, like, the, I'm always interested in what the world was like when the artist was alive and what was happening, you know, because something like, you know, something that looks so peaceful and pristine and something you show your grandmother was actually, uh, you know, horribly offensive to some people, you know, and, and if you don't know that one key component of it, you don't really understand it, you know, so just... Um, you know, just trying to understand the, the world around it and what led up to it and what came after it, you know? And, um... Your approach is you want to write, write or approach a subject, right? Yeah, research and, and just delve in. And, and you know, I, I, I might be guilty of uh, projecting too much, you know? Like, you, you can get a little bit of facts and then assume a lot based on your own experiences. But, um, you know, it's also kind of the fun thing with people from before the internet, as you can <laughs> <laughs> kind of fill in all the cracks with uh, your own ideas, you know. Well, I mean, you're speaking a, a little bit about success and failure, and, uh, you know, people often say that they learn more from failure than success. Yeah. But, um, you know, is that true for you? And, or could you speak to what you've learned from success? Definitely, yeah. I mean, my, my image, when I speak of failure, I think my image of, you know, if you, if, you, if you come of age as a musician in Portland, your role models are something like the Decemberist who headline, you know, big theaters, you know, and you think, okay, I write songs, and they're kind of literary and witty, and, uh, you know, that's my, that's my best uh, hope of what I can do, you know? And if you're falling short of that, and in my case, falling 100 rungs short of that, um, you can just feel like, well, I'm not good at music, or music's not for me, or I can't do this. And I was very fortunate. The whole reason why I'm in dance is because I was on tour and played at this, in this little town in Michigan, and we were in this little gallery, and we just hung out afterwards because we had nothing else to do in town. We played this piano, and this guy whose gallery was like the way that we played, and a couple years later, he moved to Manhattan and decided to produce a, ba a ballet, and he lived across the apartment from a, a ballet dancer from the New York City Ballet. And um, he called me and he said, yeah. do you want to write a ballet? To him, that was just natural. I was the person that played uh, piano in this interesting way. To me, I was like, what? <laughs> I, have no, I don't know anything about it. But I've always thought, you know, just say yes and then fake it and then figure out a way to do it. You know? And I had at least six months to like, look up ballet in the dictionary and you know, <laughs> figure out how to how to understand as much as I could and, and get myself up there, and also accepting that the reason why he's asking me and not Philip Glass is because I would do something outside of the establishment, you know? And so that's the wonderful thing about failure is you're not in the establishment, you're offering this other perspective that sometimes when you're insulated and you have that success, you, you, you can't offer that. So. Well, so from that experience in getting into dance, I thought, oh, well, music could be so many things. It doesn't have to be, nothing against the Decemberists, but it doesn't have to be that model of success, you know? It could be, you know, think of all the, way, think of all the ways that music is involved with things, dance, film, all this stuff, and it kind of, maybe I'm dense, but I just, it never occurred to me before that I could do that, and even writing a book, and performing a book, and going around the country and playing music while reading a book, all came from that sort of smashing of my ideal into a million pieces, and then I was like, oh, this is much more interesting, actually. <laughs> a life of, of doing these diverse things as opposed to just another band uh, headlining theaters. Yeah. So yeah, in that way, I guess. Did you try to dance yourself? 
No. <laughs> well, I did a music video actually with Can this is Candace from uh, OBT, and she uh, uh, I, w I worked with her on some pieces, and she choreographed uh, graciously and patiently. I told her I wanted to do a music video where I was dancing, and she didn't laugh at me, and she 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 got together some some real dancers and choreographed a thing, and then we went out to some some clubs at night and just danced, and she just sort of watched me. And I was like, okay, you know. And uh, she didn't offer, and she didn't criticize or say, do this or do that. She just said, she just observed and she said, oh, this is how you move, this is what you do. You, you're heavy on your heels, I remember her saying. Um, but not as a criticism, just as this is what you do. And um, whether that was a good video or not, I don't know, but I got to dance. <laughs> <laughs> when you got into uh, the dance world, were you, were you at all surprised at how rigorous and almost yeah, yeah, it's inspiring. I mean, when you are a dancer, your career is, sorry, Candace, over by the time you're 40. <laughs> um, just physically, like, you can't keep up. And even aside from that, like, I, I was just working on a new ballet in New York a couple weeks ago with this guy, Devin, from the New York City Ballet, and he said, he was just talking to a friend, and he's like, he's probably 25, and he said, I just realized today that I can never let a day go by when I'm not doing uh, dance warm-ups for an hour, you know, like, which is basically like a workout. Um, and he just sort of had this realization, like, this is what I have to do to stay in touch. And if I take four days off, I'm just this lump of uh, clay, you know, like I can't do anything. And so to see them, their dedication to it, coming from musical world where it's usually like, uh, I'll drink my PBR, uh, you know, I don't want to play guitar unless I hold my PBR and I can, you know, hang out with my friends and th that sort of like idea of like this fits in with my life whereas like for them it's this ticking clock of this has to happen now and we and if I don't prepare for it I could hurt myself I could hurt somebody else I could drop them you know it's actually dangerous if you're not preparing whereas there, there aren't those stakes with music but to watch that every day and to see them you, you feel f guilty I mean you kind of feel like a fat turd <laughs> <laughs> but also you think like how can I be more disciplined? How can I incorporate that? You know, it doesn't, it's not life or death with me, but um, I can at least, you know, it's definitely inspiring. It's frightening. Yeah, and uh, also that's their career. I mean, if they twist an ankle or something, like, yeah. Well, thanks everyone for coming, uh, and thank you to uh, Betsy and the Flipa for uh, helping with this, and, and for Portland Art Museum for putting stuff like this on. I think this is really a wonderful thing to do. And I learned a lot, and I appreciated this and all of this more. And um, so thanks for coming. And a huge thanks to you. Yeah.